good evening everyone and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary and I work in Chagas and Ballinrobe and tonight for the next hour I'm delighted to be your host. Now normally this time of year we'd host a number of indoor events but due to COVID-19 we're coming to you tonight in the form of a webinar and indeed we will conclude this current series next week with a webinar on parasite control for cattle and sheep farms next Wednesday night so keep this in mind. Now tonight the focus switches to current agri-environmental schemes and here in a county like Mayo many farmers have participated successfully down through the years in schemes such as REPS, EOS, GLOSS and indeed this year many have joined the new REAP scheme and these schemes play a huge role in maintaining biodiversity levels on farms while also providing a valuable income stream there for farmers for taking on these environmental measures and tonight our first speaker will be Tom Kelly from our Chagas office in Ballinae, and Tom will give us an update on the GLOSS and REAP schemes. By later tonight, our guest speaker will be Dr. Derek McLaughlin, who is the project manager working on the Wild Atlantic Nature Project. And indeed, Derek is based in Westport, and Derek will give us an update on the Wild Atlantic Nature Programme and how it has progressed to date. Now, you, the viewers at home tonight, are encouraged to engage with our panelists here tonight, and we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, phones, or tablets, and indeed, later this evening, Vivian Silk, the Chagas Regional Manager here in County Mayo, will put your questions to our two panellists here tonight. So please type your questions into the Q&A box. Now, indeed, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch back on our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. And indeed, look, we'd encourage you there to check out our channel and subscribe to our channel as well to see all the latest videos. So without further delay, I now am going to hand over to my colleague, Tom Kelly, from our Chagas office in Ballonet, and Tom is going to start sharing his presentation with us. And indeed, it's over to you now, Tom. Okay, uh, thanks, Brendan. Yeah, we'll just make it big screen there, Tom. That's perfect. Thanks, Brendan, and good evening to all our listeners. So basically this evening, I'm going to concentrate on the current agri-environmental schemes, the GLASS scheme and uh, the REAP scheme that many farmers here in the county are familiar with. Um, a lot of farmers are thinking ahead to 2023 to the flagship agri-environmental scheme that is promised under the programme for government. This, this includes 723 million euro of carbon tax funding. So it's going to be a substantial agri-environmental scheme, but all the details on that haven't been finalized. So I suppose we'll stick tonight to talking on the schemes that are, are there and farmers uh, you know, are participating on at the moment. So the glass for most farmers, for all farmers has come to an end, but farmers had the option of rolling over for another year for 2022. But the important point I suppose to make is that farmers needed to apply to roll over. It didn't happen automatically. So they had two options in this regard, an SMS text message for farmers that are registered for that service with the Department of Agriculture, or indeed on ag food with their planner or advisor. So the closing date for that rollover was Friday the 10th of December. So that's just gone. And uh, the uptake indeed has been very, very high. Uh, nearly all farmers have, have rolled over for another year. So just in terms of uh, GLASS, just uh, saying a few words about it, uh, look at farmers cannot make any changes to their plan. We'd advise farmers to familiarize themselves again with the details of their plan, what actions they have chosen. So no adjustments allowed. You know, there'll be a lot of questions coming in. Can they change the parcels where the wild bird cover is? Can they change maybe the hay meadow to another field? Well, no is the answer on those uh, questions. So the only change really is where, you know, land is not available. If you are leasing or renting land and that land is not available to you on your 2022 basic payment scheme application. So you need to notify the department before the basic payment scheme application in that regard next year. And uh, even if it's a priority action, the likes of the wild bird cover. A different story if a farmer is selling land. Really, if a farmer is thinking of selling land, he shouldn't have uh, maybe rolled over his glass for, for 2022. In terms of farmers applying for nitrates derogations, more and more farmers every year are applying for the nitrates derogation where their uh, stocking rate is increasing, where they're over 170 kilos of organic nitrogen, or indeed where they're over the 170 kilos and exporting slurry. In that situation, there's no payment for the low emission slurry spreading, and indeed no payment for the protection of water courses in glass. Uh, they're required under the derogation rules to, to do these uh, you know, actions under, under, under the rules of the derogation. Um, so farmers must be nitrates compliant in, at all times. And what this means is uh, there's no compulsion on farmers to take soil samples where soil samples go out of date during the original glass contract or during the glass uh, extension. However, farmers must remember if there are no current soil samples, uh, 
all their index one and two samples revert to soil index three. And indeed, the index four soils stay at, stay at index four until a new soil sample is taken. But what this means in practice is that a farmer is, 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 is if he has a lot of index one and two soils, his phosphorus allocation is very much reduced. And if a glass farmer uses too much nitrogen or phosphorus, as allowed under the nitrates, on a whole farm or indeed on a plot with a glass area-based action, you're talking there about your low input uh, pasture or your hay meadow, this is considered to be a baseline breach, which means 100% penalty for all glass actions for the one year. So this situation would arise where a farmer gets an inspection and he's required at that stage to, to, to complete and, and show his record sheets and indeed his invoices for fertilizers and meals. And uh, you know that situation can arise. So farmers need to be familiar uh, with their plan and indeed with their um, amount of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that they can apply on their farms. Um, in terms of land sold, again, we touched on it earlier, where land uh, with a glass action is sold during the term of the contract, a full clawback of money paid for the glass action on this land will apply. So that can be a fairly substantial penalty, bearing in mind that farmers now are in glass for six and up to seven years. And where this results in the loss of a priority glass action, again, you're talking about maybe their wild bird cover or something like that, this may lead to termination of the entire contract with full recoupment. So that can be a major uh, issue uh, if that happens. So where the action is not a priority action, the clawback will only apply to the, uh, to the last action on, on, in that situation. So with rented and leased land gone, um, you know, it's, it, it is an issue for some farmers that are leasing and, leasing and, and renting land if they don't have the land in 2022. Uh, you can still extend your, your contract. The land uh, must long, no longer farm, form part of your basic payment scheme application in 2022. Um, so basically, you, you, you don't have the land anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it won't work out too bad. You won't get paid for, for that action if, if, if you don't have, have it declared on, on your basic payment scheme. And this applies to all actions, uh, including the priority ones. So again, another situation we come across quite often, if the holder of the glass contract is deceased, uh, in that case, the contract must be transferred to a person eligible for such a transfer before an extension may be offered. So it must be uh, transferred to a person who doesn't already hold a glass contract. And uh, the important point here is glass contract transfer requests must be made to the glass section of the department in Johnstown Castle. And uh, they'll consider uh, the situation. And uh, in most cases, they will, uh, will transfer the glass contract, but it does need to be applied for. And information on transfers and the details around that are contained in a circular there uh, that is issued by the department. So again, penalties, and unfortunately under the glass scheme, there are penalties and there have been a lot of inspections there before uh, the glass payments rolled out in November, uh, just gone. So if a penalty is applied to my contract uh, in the additional year, that's 2022, will there be a clawback on the action on my full contract for the full six or seven years or just for the extra year? Well, you know, some of these penalties can go back. Um, so, you know, it's, up, it's, uh, it's at the department's discretion there in terms of uh, the extent and duration and severity of the penalty in that situation. So uh, again, we'd, we'd uh, emphasize the point that farmers should be aware of, of uh, the actions they have undertaken and the rules applying for those actions. Uh, just in terms of some of the penalties, uh, the low input permanent pasture, quite a few farmers maybe in the last month or two were caught maybe feeding, uh, you know, silage or hay on the low input permanent pasture, maybe they had a ring feeder out or something like that. Uh, water course is not being fenced, very common penalties in that situation. So just very quickly, uh, glass tranches one, two and three, the first tranche there uh, opened in, in 2015. Uh, so you know, farmers have taken soil samples in 15. A lot of those soil samples are, are out of date now with that situation in that in that case. Uh, glass tranche three, they were the last people into it started in 2017. So we'll go on and talk a little about the REAP scheme. As Brendan said, it's a, a new scheme this year and again quite an important scheme in the county. Um, so it's very much a different scheme than and than than the glass scheme in the past and the rep scheme because it's a results-based scheme. So basically that means the advisor uh, going out and walk on the farm and, and scoring the, uh, the fields that he walks and uh, payment is based, you know, pretty much on, on, on that assessment. 
So this year it's a pilot to prepare farmers for, as I said, the flagship agri-environmental scheme that's going to be rolled out in 2023. So it's a learning experience for the farmers, it's learning experience for advisors and indeed for the department staff as to how the scheme will be administered. So there was no guarantee of entry into the REAP scheme, there was quite a lot of interest in it in the county here. And uh, a significant number of farmers in Mayo got in uh, because, you know, they were given priority access based on the fact that um, they had, a lot of cases, they had Natura land, they were in a disadvantaged area, and uh, in other cases, they, had, they were in high status water areas. So there were the criteria for entry into the scheme. It was a two year duration scheme for 2021 and 2022, as I said, the new scheme to be rolled out in 2023. So who were not eligible to apply? Well, farmers that were ever in GLASS, and indeed we've come across situations where farmers did join GLASS initially or withdrew from the scheme or maybe were kicked out in some cases. Participants in these European innovation partnerships, and again, we'll have a look at those. There's quite a few of them uh, in the country, or indeed participants in the organic farming scheme. So um, they were um, excluded from, from this new REAP scheme. And the fields that were eligible, um, fields that were declared on the basic payment scheme application in 2020. So again, we would have come across farmers who would have new land in 2021, but that land wasn't eligible because it hadn't been declared on the 2020 uh, basic payment scheme application for that applicant. Um, grass fields, as I say, not tillage fields. And indeed, there was a lot of concern there that farmers would commonage and peatlands uh, were excluded from the scheme. And uh, I suppose that was a big issue here in, in this part of the country. So just looking at the, the innovation projects, European innovation projects that are in operation. And uh, I suppose the big ones here in the county would be the Pearl Muscle EIP. We have the Burn Life uh, Project down in Clare. Um, you have a, a big project up in Inishowen. Uh, you have the corn crake life, you have the yellow bumblebee. Uh, so there's a significant number of those EIPs. Farmers are getting paid under those programs. So they were not eligible uh, to join the, the REAP scheme. So the hen harrier is one of the bigger ones of them. Uh, you can see the areas of the country that uh, farmers are participating there. They're, you're talking about the Schlieve blooms there in Offaly, um, a small area there in Clare, and again in Cor Cork and Kerry. Uh, those areas. So unfortunately, we don't have any hen harriers up this part of, of the country. But we do have those as the pearl mussel, and we do have an EIP for that. Uh, any, I suppose, that are involved in fishing will know that the pearl mussel is in decline. Uh, they're very much uh, survive in pristine or very clean waters, and um, you know their numbers have gone way down. So back in Lewisburg, in the Bur Bundurka catchment, the river catchment there, a lot of farmers are participating in, in the pearl mussel EIP as they are in other parts of the country. So again, farmers wouldn't be eligible to apply for REAP that are involved in that. So again, for the REAP scheme, farmers had to, uh, you know, had to send a text message DAFMY. Again, farmers that are on the text messaging service would be familiar with that. They had to apply for the scheme. Uh, there was uh, an online application form and uh, basically, you know, it was fairly straightforward. Had you participated in GLASS, if, if the answer to that was yes, well, then you weren't going to get in. Were you in the organic scheme or any other uh, scheme operated uh, by the MPWS? Had you submitted your basic payment scheme for 2020 and your main enterprise? So um, then if farmers were accepted into the scheme, they had uh, they had to score, we had to score their fields and had the work submitted by the 15th of August. So again, something like the glass, uh, farmers didn't have to include all the lands they farmed. Uh, they, had, they had the choice of, of selecting different fields on the farms from two hectares up to 10 hectares. So from roughly five acres up to 25 acres of their farm for the REAP scheme. So basically how it worked, uh, the advisor uh, walked the, the field, uh, the farm in June and July and scored the fields based on, you know, the flowering plants and the biodiversity they found on the farm at the time. And most farmers in the area went for low input grassland, but equally, uh, you know, some farmers chose the multi-species lay. And um, the score that the farmer gets uh, will determine the level of payment. 
uh, that he receives. And um, there are complementary actions then for farmers to boost their, their payment levels in terms of planting trees or, or hedges. So basically, uh, the advisor uh, entered these details on a department mapping system. So when we went out onto the farms in, in, in June or July, um, we scored the fields in, in conjunction with the farmer. And basically, you know, we looked for these flowering plants, these uh, flowering plant species, and about 50% of the marks were, were given for those. The number of, of these flowering plants, and in a lot of cases, they were hard enough to find, it's fair to say. The cover, in other words, the amount of them that were there, every step you took was there, were you encountering these plants and the structure of, 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 of the vegetation. Basically, was it, um, you know, you'd, what you didn't want to see is areas that were very heavily grazed or indeed areas where there was undergrazing taking place, that there was a reasonable sort of a, a plant structure uh, uh, in the field. Again, farmers were scored and got points for their field boundaries. The more hedges, and, and I suppose it's fair to say the smaller type fields with good hedges uh, tended, to, tended to score uh, well, uh, the length of meters uh, per hectare on the farm. And finally, the field margin extent and width. So if farmers were paid to put in these field margins, uh, one, two and three meter margins, and they got paid you know, significantly for, for putting those in. Uh, there was penalties then for covers of negative indicators that we came across, the likes of the docks and the thistles and the nettles. And uh, again, cover uh, of negative indicators in the field margins uh, for poaching and damaging activities. Again, if there's, you know, uh, feeding going on over the winter where cattle are wintered, you'll always have a small bit of poaching and damaging activities would be the likes of burning and maybe dumping. So look at, in terms of um, the indicator species that we were looking for, as I say, uh, on a lot of farms, uh, it was um, difficult enough to find some of these. And as I say, the fields were only eligible for this uh, uh, low input grassland if they contained less than 30% rye grass and had at least two of these indicator species. So, you know, you're talking there, sorrel was one of the more common ones that uh, was to be found, um, mercing foil, Bird's foot trefoil, the vetches and the vetchlings. Now, the, those two are, are leguminous type plants. They, they fix nitrogen in the soil. And, um, you know, uh, they won't be found if there's much fertilizer and much slurry going out, as indeed most of these flowering plants won't be. Um, the oxide daisy, again, more so found in hay meadow type situations. The yellow composites, they're the likes of the, the, the dandelion family. The yellow rattle, uh, you know, found in traditional meadows. Uh, meadow sweet, more common, I suppose, in peaty or wet type ground. The layer jumbles there, the uh, the hogweed and those, generally you'd find those in, 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 in the field margins or the boundaries. Um, but that's basically what we were looking for, the sedges, the wood rushes and spike rushes, again more so in, in, the peaty, in the heavier type soils, the damper soils. And some, you know, what we rarely did come across was the kidney vetches, the caroline thistle, the high quality positive indicators. They were, generally speaking, fairly rare. So the other option there for farmers, if they didn't uh, do well with the, the, the low input, uh, was the multi-species lay. And again, quite a few farmers uh, opted for this multi-species lay where maybe they had receded a lot of ground uh, recently. And the payment is based on a score. You have to have a score of four. Anything above four, you were, score, you know, you were getting a reasonable score up to a maximum of 10. So farmers... Uh, had to plough the ground and put in this multi-species lay, bearing in mind the seed mixture is quite expensive for it. You're talking about, you know, uh, 100 euro per, 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 per bag for the seed mixture. And um, farmers were paid on the, these non-grass species. Um, the number of these species, uh, like uh, to be found in the field and the structure again, depending on the way the, the field is grazed. Again, you're talking about the field boundaries, the length of hedgerows, uh, Per, per hectare on, on the farm. And again, uh, you know, where you have good hedgerows or, or water courses, uh, you're, you're going to score well there. And the field margin extinct, extent and width. So again, you, you, you got more marks here on the multi-species lay for the field margins, and you could have a field margin of up to five meters with the multi-species lay. So if you were struggling on a score, uh, having a good field margin would certainly bring your points up. And uh, you, you got docked or knocked there where, where you had a, a lot of negative indicators, again, docks and thistles and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, at poaching, uh, 
plastic, that sort of thing thrown around. So just in terms of uh, the, the species that um, what uh, you would expect to find in these multi-species lay, and you'd expect to see it in the seed mixture as well. And this would be uh, drummed home to the farmers before they bought the seed mixture that they should have at least seven, seven of these uh, you know, different uh, plants listed on the seed mixture. So red clover, again, is not very common, I suppose, in most fields. And um, to be honest with you, fierce demand for the seed. Uh, and it's, it's an expensive seed as well to go into a seed mixture. Um, white clover, alcite clover. So we're talking a lot about legumes there, birds foot trefoil, and these fix nitrogen. And there's no doubt even farmers next year that won't be in the, the, the reaper uh, have anything to do uh, you know, with any of these schemes. They'll be going for some of these uh, legumes to try and uh, reduce their input of nitrogen and try and uh, reduce their costs. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, very much a legume based uh, seed mix. Birds for trefoil, uh, chicory again is very palatable. Animals love it, and um, you know it's 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 super stuff for grazing. Uh, Ribbert plantain, very uh, some of these plants root very deep into the soil and uh, can work very well in a dry year. Sheep's parsley and yarrow, and again the comment from the farmers that. Uh, so audit this year was that they were very happy with the animal performance, particularly for fattening lambs and uh, younger stock. Uh, there would be an issue possibly in a wet year with poaching, maybe with the likes of suckler cows or, or heavier stock with these multi-species lays here in the west of Ireland. So in terms of the, the payments, and that's probably what most farmers would be concerned about. Uh, so uh, in the scheme, there's a participation payment of 1,200 euro per year, and it's a two-year scheme. So you get that 1,200 euro each year. There's a capital payment of 1,200 euro in one year only, and that's made in the second year uh, based on either planting 130 broadleaf trees or 76 meters of a hedge. And the payment is fair to say is quite generous for, for either the trees or the hedges. And farmers have to have that work completed by, by March, the end of March next. Um, the field score then, as I said, we were outscoring these fields uh, last June and July, uh, the low input grassland, Again, it has to score a minimum of four, and that pay, a score of four will give you a payment of 250 euro. A score of 10 gives a payment of, of 400 euro per hectare based on the score. There's a top up there of 50 euro per hectare for late mowing meadows, and late mowing meadows means uh, mowing after the 1st of July. So that's not that much, uh, I suppose, it's not that difficult of a task. Uh, farmers in the glass scheme are already, already familiar with delaying mowing until the 1st of July. So again, there needs to be a photograph taken of that and that needs to be sent to the department. So the payment there, the maximum payment 4,500 if you have 10 hectares of the, the low input grassland, including the late mown meadow. In terms of the multi-species lay, um, now bear in mind that farmers did have to, to invest in plowing and cultivation and, and buying the seed. Uh, the payment, you know, is 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 a maximum of two thousand seven hundred and fifty euro. Really, I suppose the comment there is it could be a little bit more uh, to encourage more farmers for that multi-species lay. So the maximum score there, six thousand nine hundred if you have a very uh, species-rich farm, and five thousand seven hundred in the second year. So they're the uh, based on a ten hectare uh, in the scheme. Just a so minute or two now, Tom. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Brenton. So just finally, I just want to say a little about the Corn Creek Life Scheme. I work back in Arras in Balmullet. Uh, Corn Creek Life is a new project. It's working with farmers and landowners to improve the habitat for corn creeks in the special protection area networks and surrounding farmland. And the project partners include the MPWS, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, the Department of Agriculture, GMIT and, and Photo Wildlife Park. And the three keys uh, to corn creek conservation in the plans that, uh, that are being put in place are early season cover, that's patches of wildflower or crops such as nettles, flag iris and hogweed. Uh, Bear in mind the corn crake is a summer migratory bird. They come from West Africa in the months of April and May. So when they arrive in Ireland, they need you know, some cover for them to uh, be safe in, to, to feed in. And that's where I suppose the, this early cover uh, comes in. Uh, the middle out mowing, uh, again, that um, you know the the birds are, are nesting in, in these meadow fields, and it gives them a chance to escape and 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 for their young to escape. And the later the mowing is delayed, you know, the better the chance uh, of the birds uh, fledging and you know escaping and, and surviving. 
So farmers can select a range of actions and um, it is it is an important scheme, I suppose, and will be uh, in, into the into the future in West Mayo. So that's it, Brendan. Um, thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll just get you to stop sharing your, your screen there and look at, indeed, we have a lot of farmers on this evening, so uh, I'd encourage you again just to keep putting your questions in there to the questions and answers, and, and a good few have come in already, so we'll we'll certainly get to those. So now at this stage, I'm going to ask um, our other speaker tonight, which is our guest speaker, Derek McLaughlin from Wild Atlantic Nature Project, and I'm just going to ask Derek now just to turn on your camera, and it'll be um, over to you now, Derek, and indeed... Uh, I suppose I could keep putting your questions in there and um, we will get to those at the very end with Vivian there. So look, at, uh, over to you now, Derek. That's perfect now, Derek. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Excellent. That's great. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for, for the invitation uh, to speak here this evening. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm, as Brendan said, Derek McLaughlin, and I'm uh, the project manager on the Wild Atlantic Nature Life uh, Project. And uh, I'll just run through a, uh, I suppose, an overview of, of a key aspect of this, which is the agri-environment side of things. And it's the, it's the part of the project that's of particular interest. Uh, but just to give you a broad overview on the project itself, it's um. It's a long-term project that started earlier this year in 2021. It's got a 20 million budget over nine years, of which there's about 12 million or thereabouts from the EU and the remainder of the other eight, eight and a half or so is, is um, made up from project partners of which there's there's 10, including our, yourselves, uh, uh, Brendan and Vivian in, in Chagask as well. So there's say, 10, government uh, agencies or departments that are involved in this so it's I suppose in some ways it's a bit like herding cats but it's uh, it makes a lot of sense in trying to uh, integrate and bring these different departments together uh, the big aspect of this is uh, delivering and 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 supporting the management of, of high quality habitats and that's uh, the vein right through the project and I'll go into that in, in a short while so it's very much the vast majority of the lands that we're dealing with here are predominantly uh, blanket bogs and associated habitats. Uh, we stretch from uh, over maybe about 260,000 hectares from, from uh, South, South Galway right the way through to North Donegal. So it's a big swathe and a, a considerable area of that is in, in County Mayo as well. So it's, it's very much uh, uh, farmer focused, it's community focused, it's designed to support uh, landowners and, um, and I suppose it's, it's a platform with which uh, government agencies and departments can, can facilitate and help um, from farming and help uh, from the development of, of high quality habitats ultimately, I suppose. And then just, just very uh, briefly on the overview, it, there's a lot of different aspects to the project itself, but just in the centre here, I have this capacity building, and that's the people aspect to it. It's, it's, it's the development of, of a programme that's adapted, an agri-environment programme that's very much adapted uh, to, the, to, these, to these areas. A lot of the, you know, the previous programmes and previous agri-environment schemes are very much one size fits all. Sometimes it works okay, other times it doesn't. Um, but that's very much a key trend and key thread here is this, the development of the results-based program uh, it has similarities to REAP, we'll say, um, but perhaps maybe better adapted to, to the Western areas, knowledge exchange and, and so on. And that's that's an aspect of this project in which we're, we're collaborating with our partners, Chagas here on that, on the development of that. And you'll, I'm sure you'll hear about that more in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. And then on, on this would be a key trigger for land management uh, actions on the ground and actions that we're, we're maybe familiar with uh, that could be things like it could be um, scrub removal in, in certain types of habitats or rhododendron removal or, or lots of other various odds and ends and then the other wing of the project itself is education and awareness and that's the building of capacity and uh, schools programs and, and uh, workshops and so on so I, I, it's important to start with, with where is all of this coming from to, and, and the key aspect here is, is that very often in the past, the last 30 years, we'll say we, we've got certain policies that incentivize certain actions on the ground that then we have other actions and other policies that water policies, nature policies, climate policies, and, and they often all pull in different directions. And when they're pulling in different directions and when policies don't line up, agriculture policies, climate policies and so on, you get when you get damaged to the habitat. That's 
clearly what we, we see on the ground. From a water quality perspective, over the last 30 years, we've a tenfold decline in our high status water, which is, which is massive. That's one in 10 of those sites that were at high status 30 years ago are still at high status today. In terms of our, our habitats, we've got 15% of our high quality habitats that, that are, are, are at a state that this should be. So 15%, 85% of them are in bad or, or inadequate uh, quality. And we know that the setup with climate, we know the carbon emissions and so on over that period of time that have rapidly increased. And indeed, from a European perspective as well, they've been looking at, uh, at Ireland and other member states for that matter at, at how we spend our money in agri-environment and how effective it has, it has been used, what the benefits are on the ground in terms of the, of the, the, um, the, the function of that and the, the purposes for which it was, it was actually funded. So, and they've been very clear in saying that a lot of this money hasn't actually delivered what it's supposed to deliver. So, you know, we need to think very carefully about, about how the money is spent and we need to make sure that it, it works well and it delivers what it's supposed to deliver. And uh, uh, Tom mentioned a couple of, of programs there, some of which I've been involved in, like the uh, Pearl Muscle Project EIP. And a lot of those were, were designed to, to address these problems and, and to, rather than po two policies pulling against each other, to try and align them so that they deliver, to, to deliver the same thing. And ultimately, I suppose, secure uh, payments for, for all of these areas uh, into the future through this cap coming and the next cap and so on, because they're such an important part of our, of our farm farming landscape, farming economy, rural economy indeed. So what have we learned over the last 30 years? What are the good examples? There's a few key ingredients, looking at, at some excellent examples, the likes of the Burren programme, the Hen Harrier Project EIP, the Pearl Muscle, the, the Reeks EIP, uh, Inishon EIP. There's some fantastic examples out there. And from those, we can take the ingredients of, of programmes, schemes that have worked really, really well. We know that we know that they need to be locally adapted, they need to be practical, and they need to be results focused. So it's driven for results, not uh, you know, necessarily how many stakes have you put in, uh, but rather, but rather what, what's the quality? If it's high quality, high payment. If it's low quality, low payment. Um, it needs to be developed with, with local people. It needs to be developed with local farmers. It needs to be, it needs to work in these areas. It's very, it, it's not good enough to design something from behind a computer and never having walked in a farm or not being regular on a farm or, or, or not understanding the farming practices of different areas because they vary a lot. The style of management, the history, the traditions and so on vary massively. These need to be, they need to be properly and they need to be fairly funded as well. It's not just a matter of dreaming up perhaps your 5,000 ahead uh, for everybody here, regardless of how good or how bad they're delivered. You know, we, we wouldn't dream of going into a car sales showroom and paying over 5,000 euro or 10,000 euro and expecting to get, you know, not knowing what we're going to get. It could be a Ferrari or it could be a, you know, a, a Lada or it could be whatever in between. Generally, you, you pay good money, you get good output, you get good uh, product. If it's poor money, it's a poor product. That's often the way it is. Bring a good animal to the market, you get a good payment, a poor animal, and you'll get a lower payment. And so many of, of farmers in, in the West, you know, deliver so much from an environmental perspective, you know, the carbon taking in carbon, sequestering carbon into the soils, clean water, biodiversity and so on. And, and, and very often they're not being rewarded to the extent that they ought to be. And that's important that these are fairly funded. They need to be flexible and needs to facilitate adaptive management as well. So in other words, we do things differently. So who cares? Who cares? Wow, I do something. Who cares whether I'm closing, I've closed the gap with, with a, an, owl, uh, an owl pallet or a gate or whatever it is, provided what we're looking for is in good nick. It, the idea of building trust and local capacity is something that's very important. Trust is a very obvious one, but local capacity is something that's very important. The ability amongst the advisory services, amongst, um, amongst farmers, amongst the Department of Agriculture, scientists to be able to to be able to develop these and to be able to implement these and to be able to work these work these well and i think one of the most important ones from i think is is this idea of facilitating improvements so in other words you should never be um you should never be kind of just constrained to a certain score and that's it from for your next five years you have to facilitate improvement so if, if a farmer wants to invest in their their animals or their their land 
you know, they can do that. They put in money, they might drain or fertilize or whatever it might be and with the expected return on, on the investment. And similarly with these environmental schemes, the need to, uh, the need to uh, facilitate this improvement, the need to be able to invest in something. And as they invest in, in the environmental services, they get a better return. They improve, they get a better return from their agri environment uh, schemes. So that's, that's a big aspect to it there. And factors need to be considered outside of the farmer's control. So the idea of the, of the results-based uh, approach here is that, and it was mentioned by, by Tom earlier on as well, uh, in, a, in a REAP context, um, it, it's, it, there are differences, I, I, I suppose, and that is, is more closely adapted to the specific areas that, you know, kind of uh, Western um, areas. Um, and here, the simple idea is that the higher the quality of the score, the higher the payment. And it, so that's, that's, it's a fairly straightforward uh, scenario. It's a zero to 10 uh, scale, um, and Tom went through it very well there. I think the idea of your indicator plants, uh, you know, the cover of those is the rhododendron there, yes or no. And these are cards, these are score cards that, you know, that, you know, a school going, a secondary school student should be able to use very well, in fact. So it's, it's something that should be uh, open and available to us, uh, to us all. So in terms of the design of these, and, and I'm getting to, to what we're doing in Wild Atlantic Nature, this is the, the background to it as such. The idea is to, to future-proof, you know, these payments that, that go into the, these areas. You know, we need to, we need to adapt our, our scoring mechanisms to ensure that they reflect, you know, what's been delivered from a water quality, from, from biodiversity and from a climate perspective. So we know that, we know that a higher scoring field grassland or, or peatlands or, or woodland or scrub, we have th three scorecards there. We know that the higher that they score, the better the quality of the water that comes off of those. And the higher the score that they are, we know that the more carbon that they take in. And the higher the score, we know the better the biodiversity there as well. So they're delivering on all sides. And anyone that has a low score needs to be you know, incentivized and supported financially and, and uh, through advisory services and so on to be able to increase if they want to. And if they don't want to, there's no panic there. All the flexibility needs to be there to be able to decide as a business whether you want to invest in the environmental outputs or, or not. Simple as that. And a whole farm approach is something that's very, very important here as well. So the idea of it here is that you've got your core results-based results -based payments. And that's the payment for, you know, your score out of 10, your five out of 10, your 10 out of 10. But there's these supporting actions. And this is the thing that's extremely important. And it's a vital part of this results-based program where you have a lower score that you can draw your payments down relating to actions that will allow you to improve your score. So that's really, really crucial. That's that ability to, to improve your score. And then just on the left, you know, there's just uh, payment levels from Wild Atlantic Nature, which, which we've rolled on from um, the Pearl Muscle Project EIP, in fact, and uh, you know, it's just it just demonstrates, I suppose, for a score is less than four in this instance, it, there's, it, there's there's no payment, and for your ten out of ten, it's two hundred and twenty-five euro a hectare. And we, we banded it. We banded it is essentially a, a budgeting thing, and and to, to ensure that we can test these pilots without bursting the bank as such. Um, but ultimately, that that's that's a, a banded a banded mechanism. It, the, the the payment level increases as you increase in score. Now, I'd say that the reason there is no payment for less than a four is because like we're working on topic of, of other, uh, other schemes, sometimes, sometimes uh, GLOSS or, or, or other uh, different agri-environment uh, schemes or other, other department schemes. So there was no payment for um, less than a four in these. But I would see that on, on rollout uh, for these sort of programs should, should probably start at about one out of 10 and, and two higher, three higher and so on as you go. I'm talking about these supporting actions, this idea of, of what can you do to, to increase your, your payment. Uh, this is what I'm talking about here. So something very simple um, that just shows up on the scorecard that a farmer can do uh, straight away. You know, like you've got a river here, you've got a bit of poaching or whatever right beside it. So there's the silt going in and that, that's fine. You know, not an uncommon uh, situation. But just like that, there's, there's uh, to be a payment related to uh, putting in a livestock crossing. How you do it is, is your own business once it's functional and it works very well for, for, for this farmer here. Um, the same 
with things like it could be it could be um, peatland restoration. It could be um, it could be uh, you know they talk about rewetting and this and this kind of things, these kind of things. But uh, raising water levels is is in some instances a very important aspect to it as well. You know, if someone's scoring low because of extensive uh, drains in in a peatland context, uh, the, the blocking and damming of those. Uh, within reason, you know, within reason, ensuring that, like on the one on the left here, the before and after is is equally as grazable there. You know, you're risking, lifting your water uh, table to within a foot of of um, of the surface or thereabouts. Um, and and then of course, you know, these supporting actions could be anything. So in other words, like what do I need to do to improve my score? Well. You know, it, it might be if there's an issue with the water quality, it could be a bridge or it could be temporary fencing or it could be uh, it could be rhododendron removal if there was a low score because you've got rhododendron. Um, you know, you remove the rhododendron, uh, score goes up. So it, 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 it's, it, it's very good like that. And usually, usually where someone's scoring low and has the low results based payment, if they're interested, you know, often their payments will come from, from actions to improve their score. And this is often how it looks on the ground. You know, you've got a mix. You might have inside land that might be lower scoring or, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, a whole range probably as well. And a lot, on, on most farms, you'll find, uh, I'd say on average between maybe three, four and, and well up to 10 as well. And a lot, our average are kind of five, sixes and possibly even sevens, depending on the areas. But here, you know, you've got a, an example of a whole range of scores. And, and there's clearly a few issues there, maybe cattle in the in the water course, um, you know, silt coming from the, the ring feeder and whatever else as well, a bit of rhododendron here, um, you know, and through supporting actions, maybe putting in a buffer zone or, um, or removing rhododendron or whatever, you know, scores uh, bump up the way. So that, that's, that's essentially how it works there. Again, the importance of the importance of these co-funded supporting actions are something that's very important. So, uh, and again, it, it's whole farm. So that's something that that um, it takes in commonage. It takes in uh, your inside land and so on. So there's, there is capacity for payments there. And um, in the context of, of of what we've been developing and what we have on the ground in wild Atlantic nature, um, there there isn't a payment cap there. And it would be fairly strong. It's something I mentioned at the beginning that that uh, you know you need the flexibility to improve it's not a, a payment level isn't a target but that we have digressive payments so that there's a lower payment for for the higher hectare of course as well but ultimately if it's still delivering it's still delivering and it should still be paid on and that's something that's really important um so here we've got this idea of you know we're, we're talking about what does our land deliver and and it's looking at it from a very different kind of way because we know we think of our land as producing food and producing food only. But now we know a climate, we know biodiversity and water quality and all of these kinds of things that actually delivers a whole load of things. And it's important that that's acknowledged, you know, and it's important that, that that's actually in the mix as well. And here, like we've got our biodiversity, the stable climate, carbon uh, and, and protection of soils and all of these kind of things, flood management in these lands. And that's that's very much what, what the basis of this is. So here, quality is, is the key aspect here. So the idea of the basis of, of farmer payments, um, you, you know, and, and from the perspective of even something like food labeling, the idea of being able to associate, um, you know, scores in a given area to, uh, to, to a label on, on the food that's been produced is something that's extremely powerful as well in minute, adding value to that. About a minute or so now, Derek, if you could. Maybe that's right. I, I'll, 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 I'll build, build on here now. And so then just to, to come to the end of uh, here now, just on, on um, our project uh, and our, our, uh, the results-based project that we've uh, developed here at the moment this year, we've got 167 farmers uh, covering over 20,000 hectares in the Owned of Nathan uh, SAC. And, and it was very good interest there. We brought in another um, 680,000 actually in complementary funding. That was additional funding to, to cater for that for that interest uh, for those farmers there. So I'm delighted to have Tom and, and several of his colleagues as, as part of our 26 uh, trained advisors. Um, and there'll be further rollout of this into uh, in, in the CAP, uh, in 22, in preparation for the CAP rather. Um, perhaps later we could maybe discuss just how, how maybe it will fit in the CAP and so on. But just uh, in summary, 
like it, what it does is that it pulls these things together, it pulls the different types of policies together, and and it, it pays for them in a very simple, uh, simple model with a focus on on quality and it invests in invests essentially in the, in the skills of of farmers uh, rather than your kind of your just one size fits all um one size fits all payment same payment for for absolutely everybody so there's there's it's a very good opportunity as well from the perspective of you know local issues or things as, as they as they come up um we're we're funding um a rhododendron control project a locally based rhododendron control project in 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 um with the lean and development association for for example there there's a lot of information there on our website wildatlanticnature.ie and there'll be updates about you know where we're operating next owned off nathan this year We'll have some of Glenamoy, Ox Mountains, uh, Loch Nill and above in Donegal and a few other places there as well. So you can um, g- keep uh, up to date on that via, via the website. Thanks very much and um, thanks for listening. That's brilliant, Derek. And look, thank you very much. I'll just get you just to stop sharing your screen. And now at this stage, we have a load of questions after coming in there now tonight, folks. So look, at, uh, I'm just going to go swiftly over there to Vivian Silk there, our Chagos Regional Manager. So over to you now, Vivian. And indeed, any unanswered questions um, will be followed up in the coming days by our participants. So uh, we'll try and get through as many of them as we can tonight. OK, over to you now, Vivian. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, Derek, I'll give you a minute to, to gather your thoughts there. The first couple of questions, I'll have them for Tom. Tom, just a question. Um, it was probably brushed over maybe um, by the department even at the start, uh, to my knowledge, but there's farmer training talked about for the REIT scheme. It was initially planned to take place between the entry to the scheme and the first payment. Um, I don't think this has happened. Can you tell me a little bit more about this, Tom? Uh, well, with the COVID and everything, uh, Vivian, I think I think it has been put off. I don't know of, of any training that's up and coming in the next uh, couple of weeks, anyhow, at least. So um, just sit tight, I suppose. Any farmers in REAP would get notified about it and uh, certainly we'll be in contact with them if uh, if there's any training due. Yeah, I, I also think, Tom, um, that as the, as the advisors were out doing the REAP assessment during the summer, there was... Um, uh, kind of, I suppose, uh, an understanding or encouragement that the farmers would, would learn from the advisors at that stage. And each advisor has to revisit the um, farms next year during the flowering season again to make sure everything is there. So it might be built into that, possibly, but as you said, Tom, the COVID situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the next question, Tom, is, is, is again kind of a, a, a glass one. In uh, 2022, can I divide a parcel of my BPS application while continuing to maintain? Sorry, maintain the terms laid out in the glass plan. Um, well, is that a, is that a glass action? Is there a glass action on that parcel? I'd say there would be some, yeah. Um, I would think no is the answer there. That the no change is allowed in terms of you know your glass actions. So no is the answer. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. And I think there's just, just a kind of a general comment I, I won't ask, ask, ask a question on it, but you mentioned a lot about the soil samples, Tom, and that some of them must possibly may be out of date at this stage, depending on when you join glass and when the soil samples are taken. The comment here is that, especially in terms of, of, of maybe P's and K's, that um, if the samples were taken back four to five years ago, they are now going into 2022, possibly out of date. So the farmer just needs to be conscious when they are buying P's and K's next year. Now, as you know, the price of it may, may limit the purchase of it uh, if, if it stays at current level. So um, that, that, that probably will have a bigger effect than anything we might say or do. But just in terms of farmers that may be buying P and K or thinking about for next year, they need to consult their consultant. Um, have a look at the glass pen and see the limits there because uh, the penalties are, are, are varied. Um, one for you, Derek, now. Um, it's, it's from a farmer living in, in Ballycroy. And the question is, they have entered your project, uh, thankfully, and there's, there's a large quilcha plantation near them. And I suppose the concern is, can quilcha possibly remove and re-wet these peat areas and, and, and how that affect the programme? Yeah, I, I, uh, that's a very interesting question, around because in many areas and in, in a lot of my experience that, um, you know, farmers can be doing absolutely everything, everything's 100% and then it could be something else that's causing a problem. It could be, you know, uh, you know water issues or it could be uh, forestry or whatever. Uh, Quilcher are a partner in this project as well and um, they'll be 
the restoring uh, two sites in particular to um, to blanket bog in this the total in about uh, 160 170 hect hectares. There aren't any sites uh, around Ballycroy, but in in our work this year on on the Wild Atlantic Nature Project and with working with farmers, there's actually a lot of farmers and there's a big appetite to to look at some of the wetter sites that are failed plantations on deep peats and that are losing carbon. So that's something that's very important to bear in mind there as well. And uh, it, it's something that we would hopefully um, be able to uh, to to approach and and hopefully do something about at least some of these sites. So so I I would I would be hopeful of um, just kind of prioritising sites with the most most necessary to deal with and, and uh, in within a couple of years being able to 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 go at those. Okay, Derek. Just while you're on the topic, uh, the same the same uh, viewer has a, has a question in about rewetting. Um, just to ask Derek, will there be workshops and how? bog rewetting can be done properly or well uh, and is there any plans for that yeah there is um like we're due to have training actually uh, as, as we speak actually in the last uh, last three and four weeks but obviously we can't with, with covid and whatnot um and um that was a general training on the overall program and for all of our actions here we would see that that the farmers ideally the farmers would do those actions would do the the many if it's drain blocking if it's removal of road dendron if they're interested in doing that that they would and for all of those things there'll be there'll be very uh, comprehensive training in those because if you if you build capacity in, in the ideal land management practices in these areas it's the ideal scenario okay. um, one, for, one for you tom i know you're familiar with this project i just find the question here now again uh now here on, bear with me. Uh, the, the mock air project tom uh Person in, person in North Mew as well. Um, what's the plans for that and how, how is that progressing? Well, uh, the MacAir project has got has, has received funding and it has been approved, so that's to be rolled out from next year. So farmers with MacAir grassland uh, will be eligible to join that scheme. Um, so, you know, pretty much you're talking about Eris and um, uh, some parts of West Mayo there. And kind of requirements, Tom, can you enlighten our, our viewers on that? Or what, what's envisaged? Well, again, it'll be a results-based payment, so uh, planners will be out, they'll be trained uh, in assessing, uh, you know, the vegetation quality and the biodiversity on the farms. So the way the land is managed in terms of stocking rate, fertilizer usage, and that sort of thing. So, you know, where there's a heavy stocking, uh, a lot of fertilizer going out, the, those farms are going to score poorly, uh, where, you know, where sites are well managed, as Derek talked about there, where you have great, you know, biodiversity and plenty of flowering plants. Uh, those areas are going to score highly and do well. Okay, uh, possibly one for Derek again. Um, Derek, how would results-based payment work on a commonage where some farmers on that particular commonage are heavily involved and others choose not to not, not to participate? Well, the way that uh, the results-based payments work on the commonages in our program is that um, is that whoever wants to join, wants to participate, is is obviously welcome, and uh, once they're eligible. Um, the payment relates to the overall commonage, and that's set, it's divided amongst those that are participating. So, the higher the higher the score of the commonage, the the, the higher the payment on that. Um, I'm not sure which we want to answer this question. If you can, but it's a futuristic one in my view. Can you sell the carbon rights of your land as well as claim glass and single farm payments in 2022? Well, uh, Vivian, I suppose if I, I'll, I'll chance my arm at that and then maybe uh, <laughs> then we could get Tom in uh, to, to, cor to correct us. Um, yeah, with, with carbon credits, I mean, it's something that, that hasn't really been developed. Uh, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of larger companies that are looking to invest, you know, in, in re-wetting and whatever. But one thing I'd be, I'd be very careful of is that, um, for example, in a peatland context, uh, reasonable quality bog that's you know that's fully vegetated and whatever else as well is is pretty much carbon neutral so it's not taking in carbon it's not leaving it uh, you know very very high quality bog is slowly uh, taking in carbon but any drain in a bog and it's losing carbon so uh, you know heavily uh, cut uh, bog uh, could be losing six tons of carbon per hectare per year so um, it, it's one that uh, I'd be reluctant from a farmer's perspective to get you know to go too far down big and the price of carbon it, it, per ton is, is is relatively low as well so you'd want to be careful that one doesn't end up with a liability if we're going too far down that road i oh, know uh, it's very much down the road vivian uh, we wouldn't have any figures on that uh, as derek says there it's uh, 
a dangerous uh, <laughs> proposition maybe at the moment. Yeah. Um, another, another question for you, Tom. Uh, can a farmer increase the areas for reap uh, scheme in year two? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's some flexibility on, on that, Vivian. Um, certainly uh, you can change, um, you know, his scores certainly can go up. I don't think the area involved can go up. No, that has been mapped and it's up, uh, it's up on the department mapping system at the moment. But certainly he can increase uh, his payment by putting in uh, maybe some margins or, 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 you know, his score can increase if he's managing his grasslands. Uh, already already mapped, but I, I think yeah. the areas are quite set at this stage, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and as you know, or anyone participating in REAP knows, it's, it's a scheme that's spending from kind of the second half of 2021, which we're almost at the end of now, and all 2022. And that, that will finish the REAP scheme. So in 2023, the new environmental scheme will be out at that stage. So yeah, there'll be scope to expand and change in that. But I don't think the area, I think the areas are set down pretty well. As Tom, as Tom mentioned, you can increase the scores in your fields, all right, in particular fields that are mapped already. Okay. Um, and I know, let's see, there's another one here for, for uh, Tom as well, in terms of the, in terms of the, in terms of the REAP. Um, what is the maximum area of land that can be included in the REAP scheme? I think you covered that in your talk, Tom. Yeah, 10 hectares, Vivian. 10 hectares of land, 25 acres. Okay, which is uh, already decided, as we said, with the, with the last question. And, and another one, Tom, for you, I think it's, it's true to the REAP as well. When do new hedges have to be planted under the REAP scheme? Yeah, well, any farmer that uh, selected that complementary action, the planting of hedges needs to have that completed by the end of March 2022. Okay, so any time from now on, let's say, to get, get cracking yes. at it. Yeah, yeah. so the, the Christmas holidays can be used up at, at, at that job if needs be. Um, another question now for you, Derek. Just going to scroll back up the page here now. Um, sorry, the Wild Identic Nature pr uh, Project, Derek, I presume that the answer is, is almost in your presentation, the first slide. Will this scheme roll over into the new cap? Well, a big aspect of it is, is building capacity for, for the new cap um, and that I would see that from 2023 that, you know, those that are in our programme uh, and we will feed into the actual development of it because, you know, it's nothing set, it's, it's pilot at this stage. So like as, as we get feedback from farmers at the end of the first year that, that, that it can be adapted and so on and it's likely that from 2023 that that will be carried on via cap, via the new agri-environment scheme. Last question, just as coming there as, as you were talking, uh, Derek, is the Wild Eclectic Nature Program taking new participants in Mayo for 2022? It it will be a but in 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 constrained areas as such, not constrained areas, but but specific or predefined areas. So there'll be uh, next year we will have. Um, we will have uh, some of Glenamoy or Glenamoy uh, bog complex. Uh, there'll be Ox Mountains uh, will be brought in. Um, now, again, it, it, it is pilot and there will be um, some limited uh, space for anyone that wants to come in in the target areas next year. But on our website there, you'll see the, the, the target areas and, um, and, and contact us. You know, there is an expression of interest form online as well, and, and it does no harm at all to, to fill that in and, and send it to us or just make contact with us. You can find the contact details on, on the website there, buildatlanticnature.ie. I'll just conclude by saying, folks, that the whole hour has been recorded, as Brenda mentioned at the start, and it will be available to watch back over the next couple of days whenever we get it out there. So on our YouTube channels and, and links from our, our um, regional Facebook and Twitter pages as well. So any of your colleagues or our neighbours that missed tonight can watch it back on that. And, and, and I'll hand over to Brendan to conclude. Thank you very much, Vivian. So we're just about out of time there this evening, and I'd like to thank our three panellists here tonight, uh, Derek uh, Derek McLaughlin, uh, Tom Kelly, and indeed Vivian Silty, our regional manager here, for their help tonight with their webinar. And indeed, I suppose most importantly, thanks to you at home for engaging with us here tonight. We have lots of questions. There may be a few there we'll have to go back and just see that we and, and answer them. And indeed, we hope we found you found this webinar beneficial. And as Vivian said, we'll be getting the recording uploaded on our Chagos Mio YouTube channel in the coming days. All that's left for me to say is that we'll be back here again next Wednesday night, the 22nd of December, for the final episode in this current series, where parasite control and the timely animal health issues will be discussed uh, with our colleague Amy Connolly there in Chagos and Ballina, and well-known Chagos beef specialist Aidan Murray joining us on the night. So indeed, put that into your diary there uh, next Wednesday night, the 22nd of December at 8pm, and the same link will work again. 
for that serious uh, conclusion. So indeed, it's good night from us all here in County Mayo and keep safe, folks, and see you all again next Wednesday night. Thanks, folks. Thanks, folks. Good night. Thanks.